Okay, so this uh, past week we have seen the, or we have started to, to look at the projection of stresses on a 2D, uh, on a line for two dimensions or in a plane for three dimensions. For that, what you have to do is to look at uh, the new lecture, which is lecture five, stress projection on a plane. And here you will see the methods to project the stress in two dimensions and in three dimensions. For two dimensions, it's pretty easy. You just use the more circle. Uh, but I just wanted to remind you that this can also be applied to three dimensions. If you have the 3D more circle and you apply this method, uh, which is explained in section 5.4.1 uh, of my undergraduate notes. It's the same application, but you just have three circles. The only thing is that in this particular method, uh, if one of your planes has to coincide with at least one principal stress. And what that's going to mean is that your state of stress is going to be on one of these three circles, not in the middle, but on one of those three. In order to get stresses for a plane which is in the middle, that would mean that such plane, like in this example, does not coincide with any of the principal stresses. So in that case, what you have to do is uh, you have to apply now this tensor method, uh, which is reviewed in this class, and for which in the lecture, you can find the derivation of the equations uh, from scratch. And basically what we do is just geometry, but in three dimensions and with vectors and matrices. At the end of the day, uh, what you find out is that the traction vector in, in needed uh, in order to keep the other slice part of a solid in equilibrium with a given stress tensor is going to be given by this vector, which is a product of the matrix times the, the components of a normal vector to the plane, where n are uh, the components uh, of uh, a normal vector to the plane. Let me just repeat that. Um, so that's basically it mathematically, but then in order to take this one step further, what we have to do is to define both the stresses and the vector n in a common coordinate system. In the Mathematical derivation here, the only thing we're doing is we are referring to a to a coordinate system, which is a coordinate system one, two, three. And mathematically, that's okay. And remember, both the state of stress and the vector n are uh, derived in this coordinate system. All right, but in real conditions, then uh, we need another coordinate system. And this is the the north, east, and down, or depth coordinate system. So any state of stress, any principal stress that we may have, either if it coincides with the east direction or not, with the north, or even if we have a vertical stress, which is a principal stress or not, in order to apply this method, we need to bring this tensor into this coordinate system north, east, and depth. And in order to do that, we use this uh, uh, matrix, this transformation matrix. And at the end of the day, in order to get the results that we want, also we need to derive or obtain this vector n in the coordinate system of default. And then we just multiply that now in the same coordinate system, SG, and n, and n in this case, because it's normal to, to default. And by using the, the other components, n, s, and n, d, then you can obtain the components along the dip and along the strike. And with those, also we can get to know in which direction a hypothetical slice of the block, or if we're across a fall or across a fracture will move along the deep, along the strike, or in which direction. 
So this is what we have to do today. And uh, you just have to code all, all of these equations. Uh, so it, it's, it's going to take a few lines in order to do that. And uh, in order to apply that, what we're going to do is we're going to work on this wiki project number two, in which you're going to basically use the same code, but you're going to use it in uh, in two. You're going to use it in two in two examples. And uh, the first example is an example about calculating stresses on fractures along a wellbore. This is something which uh, it is quite important, especially when you have naturally fract fracture formations, and those fracture formations contribute to permeability. Uh, uh, let me repeat that. The fractures within the formation, they contribute to permeability. Uh, you have even some reservoirs where the porosity and the permeability is all composed just by fractures. For example, there are some igneous uh, formations that uh, originally they didn't have any oil and gas, but uh, they might have been charged over time with oil and gas. And now you have a reservoir within an igneous formation. This happens, for example, in some parts of uh, Southeast Asia uh, offshore, where uh, some geologically older rocks are now above some uh, geographically above some sedimentary rocks that produce oil and gas, but now they are charged with oil and gas. And in order to get to know in which direction you drill a wellbore, and you take advantage of the fractures and fracture permeability, what you do is calculate what is the state of stress on the fractures and figure out if those are close to failure or not. Okay, an important part also of uh, this lecture is, is that to understand after we calculate the stresses on a fault to figure out if they are close to failure or not. And let me check quickly here in the video. I think I, I put this somewhere over here. And yeah, right here. So at the end of the day, we went to plot a Morse circle, a 3D Morse circle, and calculate what is the actual state of stress on those fractures or faults. And we'll do this by plotting the 3D Morse circle, plotting what is tau and sigma n on that Morse circle, and see how close it gets to the failure line. And in this particular example, uh, I had a student who also went one step further and plotted each possible state of stress within the 3D Morse circle with a color code and plotting the ratio of tau over sigma n uh, with uh, higher tau over sigma n, that means uh, a warmer color, and lower tau over sigma n, eventually if it goes to zero, like on the x-axis, then that goes to colder colors, like blue. So the, the closer you go into this warmer region, that means is the higher the ratio of shear over effective normal stress. And that also means the highest the possibility of that to slip in shear, to slide uh, with one surface respect to each other in shear. And you can imagine that if that fracture is sliding, either in a short time or in a geological time, that's going to create a lot of uh, asperities within the fault. And it's also going to cause fracture dilation and that's going to help uh, fractures who have a high conductivity. So that's what we want to, to, to know. We want to know where these fractures are with respect to the Morse circle. And also, we would like to know, let me advance a little bit over here, where those are located uh, with respect to, uh, let me mute this, with respect to the coordinate system. And that's done. I think I went too much further. Uh, that's done with these uh, stereo nets. That I'm not going to ask you to do this right now, but if you have some time, uh, it would be a good idea to go ahead and and check how to plot also these fractures 
in a steady net projection. It's not, it's not too difficult. Uh, so I'm just waiting for myself to to go into the steady net plot. Okay, there we go. So so this is a steady net plot, and with this steady net plot, you can get to know where those fractures are in the with respect to the coordinate system. Something that we cannot see right away in the 3D more circle, but you can see it in the stereo net. And in this particular example, also you see what are the regions in which you would expect the ratio of shear to effective normal stress to, to be the highest. All right, so this is the first problem, calculating stresses along a wellbore uh, for a set of fractures. And in this one, the first thing that you have to do is uh, to obtain the state of stress from the exercise number one. And after that, it's just uh, write equations and calculate the stresses on those fractures. And in this case, this is a synthetic case in which we're assuming what the orientation of the fractures is. It's just an exercise to, to try out your code that is working well. Uh, but it, it's the, the same, uh, the same workflow. You get in a state of stress, you put that into the coordinate system, uh, which is a geographical coordinate system. You obtain also the, the vectors that apply to your fault. And after you do that, uh, you multiply those to each other and obtain what, uh, what is the effective normal stress and shear stress. And for problem number two, it's very similar, but now is for a higher uh, scale or a, a bigger scale in which we're going to look at stresses on faults, not on fractures, but on faults. These are much bigger uh, geological features. And uh, we, what, what you're going to do is, given the state of stress, calculated also as a function of depth, now you're going to have to calculate state of stress as a function of depth. It's not, it's not going to be only one, but you're going to have uh, as many as elements or rows of this table. But it's, it's going to be pretty easy, don't worry, because that's going to be aligned with the geographical coordinate system. So given state of stress at default, let's say fault F1, what you have to do is you have to tell me if that fault is close to shear reactivation or not. And this is exactly the same procedure, but now you have to apply it to a fault. And for these faults, I'm giving you what is the geometry uh, and a geometry simplified to just a planar segment. So here we have a, a, a full model of, those, of that uh, uh, particular uh, sand, but now here I, I have simplified to planar surfaces where this first point is the origin, the second point is the end, and you have the depth at which that fault is. Uh, with that, you're going to calculate the stresses, and with the dip and also the strike that you're gonna get from the origin and the end, you can calculate all these, you can calculate the matrix, you can calculate also the components of the of the plane of the fault, and then you do the multiplication and you do a similar thing, and you uh, end up with calculating uh, the effective normal stress and the shear stress on the plane of the fault and tell me that's close to failure or not. There is one more thing that you're gonna have to do in this uh, particular exercise. Uh, let me go over here. Number two, it's a in this particular problem, also we're interested in getting to know what is the maximum pressure that we can have in this particular sand and in these blocks, and especially on the faults, so that we do not have full reactivation. And what you're gonna uh, find is something similar to, to what I'm going to show in a minute. Let's see if it's over here. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I think it is right here and you're going to end up uh, with something like this this is the 2d version but you're going to have 3d more circle in which you want to have your 3d more circle 
you're gonna have your shear failure line. And what you have to tell me is how far this more circle is from the shear line. And what we're going to assume is that this circle is just going to translate to the left. And that means lower effective normal stress as we have a change of pressure in the reservoir. And the distance that the circle can move to the left without the change of diameter tells you a conservative value of what is the maximum pressure that that particular reservoir uh, can, uh, can have without full reactivation. We're interested to this problem because there are some of these uh, reservoirs in which we may be doing water flooding, we may be doing uh, pressure maintenance, or we may be storing some other uh, fluids or gases like say uh, methane, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and we do not want to increase the pressure so much that we destabilize one of the faults, which are part of that uh, formation. Some of these faults uh, may be sealing, may be part of the structural sealing of the reservoir, so we don't want to mess up with them, and we want to know what is the maximum pressure that we can increase within a particular formation. All right, so this is uh, the general explanation of the problem, and let me stop recording. <clears throat>